Heads up, because you are in the Hoodwood. I'm the Black Bandit, KJ Green, welcoming you to Sports from the Hoodwood with March 8, 2019. Coming up this week, is LeBron damaging his rep in L.A. now? Is Bryce Harper trying to create a super team in Philadelphia? Where is Antonio Brown going? During Buffalo, March Madness is upon us, and the Hoodwood Hot 5 has more info and takes you to take a figure. All that, that back from head slap, and a multitude of info and opinions in this cornucopia of sports called Sports in the Hood with Pesky Seatbelt. Let's go. You're tuning in to Sports from the Hoodwood, the internet's foremost location for the most honest, unfiltered commentary and insight on the world of sports. Now, once again, here's Hoodwood's hometown hero, KJ Green. Green from the Hoodwood, where that pesky groundhog knows better than to come out around this neighborhood that he has an open contract hit on him because of the bad weather that's in the Hoodwood. How y'all doing? I'm KJ Green, and welcome back to the Hoodwood for this second weekend of March. And I'm sorry, I'm just sick of snow. <laughs> I'm sick of snow, I'm sick of cold weather. I'm just used to having at least a hint of warm weather as the basketball tournaments are starting to ramp up. March Madness is upon us, and I'm really excited about it. We'll get to that here with the Hoodwood Hot 5 in just a, just a little bit. But first, we've got to keep touching on that messy situation in Los Angeles called the LeBron situation. And, and last week, I, I touched on it, and it seems like this situation is getting even messier. The Lake Show just seems to take bad loss after bad loss after bad loss. The nadir of it was losing to the Wobegon Suns. How do you lose to the Suns? Well, I asked Milwaukee, but that's neither here nor there. But they weren't beating anybody but themselves. And it just seems like the Lakers are falling into one after another after another bad loss. They're 3 and 9 since the 1st of February. And they have wins over the Pelicans, with Anthony Davis not playing the fourth, the Rockets, and a buzzer-beating win over the Celtics. And you can be damn sure that Saturday, the Celtics will have that on their mind when they play against the Lake Show in Staples. And as widely reported, the Lakers are sinking faster than a stone in a lake, and the schedule is doing them no favors. They still have another Eastern run on their docket, trips to Chicago, which isn't a real big thing, but road trips are always tough. They've got to go to Toronto, Detroit, New York, and Milwaukee. Now, if you think that the Lakers can win any more than a couple on this trip, and Chicago and New York are both pushes at best. I mean, Toronto, they're going to get smashed. Detroit, they're going to get slapped around. And I don't even want to think about what Milwaukee's going to do to them. Giannis Antetokounmpo is playing like MVP, and the Lakers are playing out the string. LeBron looks like he's going through the motions now. Yeah, 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 I know. He's averaging 27-8. and eight. But honestly, he doesn't have a lot of help. There's no reliable three-point shooter on this team. There's no reliable big man on this team. And the role players that are on this team are first and second year players who are sitting back thinking, LeBron doesn't want to play with me. Why should I play hard for him? And he's talking about making a playoff push. These guys don't know anything about playoff pushes. And LeBron is doing nothing. I repeat, nothing to guide them. I mean, and it doesn't even seem like he's playing defense. I mean, there was a couple of times in the game against uh, Denver where he was just standing in the middle of the floor. Like, like if there was a, a field of daisies there, he would have been picking daisies. Like, yep, yeah, yeah. Kyle Kuzma had to push him out to defend somebody. LeBron has seemed to disappear in the big situations, and he is shooting a, a career low 66.9% from the charity stripe. Clutch players don't shoot that bad from the line. LeBron's legacy is on the line, period. He is already 3-6 and six in the finals, and L.A. is not going to the playoffs this year 
They're going to be missing the playoffs for the first time since 2005. And that in itself is going to bring the Baying Wolves out in force. I mean, can LeBron attract key free agents now? Honestly, do you think that a Kawhi Leonard or a Kevin Durant or a Klay Thompson will want to go downstate to L.A.? Given the mess that that t- situation is in, do you think the Lakers will even want to keep LeBron? Magic Johnson and Rob Palenka have an absolute mess on their hands. There are rumors that they may even want to trade LeBron James and just wipe the slate clean and start over. If you listen to sycophantic sick- fans like 2 Chains, come on, why does anybody give a rat's ass what 2 Chains has to say about who? Wait a minute, time, time out, time out, time out for a side rant. I watch these spin doctors, especially rappers, get on these uh, roundtable talk shows and try to speculate on where they think players should go, like they have some sort of inside info on what these players are thinking. I mean, there are some, like, uh, like Lil Wayne, when he's not drinking that stuff, he can be a very articulate, if not very insightful and bright, commentator or someone who can speculate on basketball as kind of from a fan's perspective i've actually seen him be on um the uh, first take and, and skipping shannon undisputed i've seen him on these talk shows and he's very very bright he sits there with his glasses i mean it looks weird with glasses all them tattoos on his face but glasses but talking about basketball and he sounds like he has some sort of sense about him when he's not drinking but more often you have these idiot fans yeah i'm talking to you too james whoever the hell this guy is he comes off sounding like a ranting fan on a bar stool talking about this player and that player coming to la like it's a foregone conclusion like everybody wants to come to la the lakers haven't made the playoffs in six years that's their longest drought in team history why would players want to sacrifice their career to come to L.A. to try to rebuild something that hasn't really been built and hasn't been playing well in quite some time? They don't know, and their speculation sounds ignorant. Yes, I said ignorant. Now, we'll take our first time out of the day, come back, talk about Bryce Harper, how he's trying to build a super team in Philly, and is he going to get himself into a lot of trouble doing so? Sports from the Hoodwood rolls on after this timeout. You're tuned into Sports from the Hoodwood, the Internet's foremost location for no-nonsense commentary, insight, and opinions on the world of sports. Here now live in living color, black by popular demand. Your host, KJ Green. You are back in the Hoodwood. I am KJ Green, and it's going to take some time for me to get used to old faces and new places. Manny Machado in San Diego is going to take a little bit getting used to. It's going to take me a long time to get used to Yasiel Puig wearing Cincinnati Reds duds. That's going to be interesting in itself. Bryce Harper finally found a landing place in Philadelphia, and I think maybe one of the reasons why he went to Philly instead of the San Francisco Giants was because of the California tax rate. I mean, he's going to be paying a whole lot of taxes to begin with, but going to Philly may have made more financial sense to him. Now, while Bryce Harper is trying to ingratiate himself in Philly, is Uh, Press conference flubs notwithstanding, and I'll get to that a little bit later. He is trying his best in not too subtle ways to get additional reinforcements to his new team that he's going to be with for the next 13 years. Mike Trout of the Anaheim, Los Angeles, whatever you want to call it, SoCal Angels, is probably the next hottest superstar that will be coming down the free agent runway though he won't be coming down that runway for another couple of years yet but Bryce Harper has reached out to Mike Trout and he has made a case on social media for Trout 
who is a Jersey guy, grew up in South Jersey, and grew up rooting for the Philadelphia Phillies. He is making a case for Trout, when he becomes a free agent, to join him in Philadelphia to become, I don't want to say a super team, like you can't really make super teams in baseball like you can in, in, in basketball, but that would be a loaded lineup. I mean, I was speculating for the longest time Harper going to the New York Yankees would make that a loaded lineup. For pitchers having to face Bryce Harper and Mike Trout back-to-back would be a nightmare. But never mind that Harper making his case on social media is blatant tampering and against rules. The powers in the MLB were none too happy about Harper's campaign. Never mind that Trout is still under a lengthy contract to the Angels for this and next season. A very high price contract, if I might add. And you can bet the mortgage that Artie Moreno is not going to sit idly by and let his prize bull and Mike Trout, who brings people into the seats, walk without so much as a protest or a whimper. Yeah, yeah, I know. He paid out the nose for Albert Pujols, who is barely making cadaver motions in Los Angeles now. But he is going to try his best to hold on to Mike Trout, who is one of the most talented, if not the most talented player in Major League Baseball. For the season, Mike Trout batted 312, 39 home runs, 79 RBIs. How do you have 39 home runs and 79 RBIs? That is kind of crazy. But still, he still had, he also had those numbers, had 24 stolen bases, had led the American League with 122 walks, 25 intentionals, and had a 1,000, a perfect fielding percentage. So you are talking about probably the number one player in baseball, probably one of the best five tool players in baseball. Now, he makes $33 million. $33 million. Lord, I wish I'd have been able to hit a ball, been able to hit a curveball in my youth. But nevertheless, I digress. Mike Trout will be, at the end of next season, at the end of the 2020 season, the most sought-after free agent in the market, period. Bryce Harper yeah, he was, you know, people, teams wanted him, but everybody knew he was going to have a big price tag. Mike Trout's going to have a big price tag to boot, but he looks like he's worth it. He looks like he will be one of the biggest names to come down the free agent pike in a while. And he will be 29. So you're looking at a, a player who could realistically crack the four hundred million dollar mark in salary guaranteed money but Bryce Harper is campaigning for Mike Trout is blatant and obvious and never mind the Phillies have a capable center fielder in Odible Herrera now he has to hear for the next two years does Bryce Harper really want you Are you going to be comfortable with that? He's going to hear that from the media endlessly. Now, Harper has been what he wants to be. Really doesn't care who he offends to get it. He has been a player who wants what he wants and will say and do what he wants to get what he wants. Now, some people think that recruiting is good for Major League Baseball. will ramp up interest on who might go where. I personally don't think it is. As I mentioned before, Trout is two years away from his walk here. Two. And a lot can happen in two years. Where were you two years ago? I know where I was at two years ago and I wasn't happy. Two two years later, I'm in a better place. But a lot of things can change in two years. And how much things can change may say a lot. Harper is doing himself no favors in his own clubhouse. Trying to stack a uh, a team of people that he he wants and he wants to play with. This, I think, will be a growing headache for second-year Phillies manager Gabe Kapler. And I really don't think he's going to be around a long time to see the the fruits of whatever machinations that Harper is trying to pull off. 
I mean, there are people like Buster Only of ESPN who have said this stirs the hot stove that MLB should just kind of roll their eyes at it and not say anything. I'm thinking that players openly can't um, players openly can campaign for other players to join them. And have been doing it for decades. And you can see it when people are at the batting cages and they're, you know, players from other teams are talking. But I don't think it's good for the game because all it's doing is creating division in your own clubhouse. If I'm a superstar of a team and I'm talking to another superstar, somebody we're trying to beat and trying to recruit them for our team. What does that say for the players who have that person's position? It's not like basketball where you can get multiple players and sub them in and out. A starting center fielder is going to play a lot. And you already have Andrew McCutcheon in left. Bryce Harper is obviously going to play right. So then you have center field. What kind of dissension is that going to create in the locker room? That is going to make for a messy situation. And I still think Bryce Harper has done himself no favors in a clubhouse that he hasn't been in in a week. He has just only been in the Phillies clubhouse. Just about a week. And now all of a sudden, he's trying to run things like this is his clubhouse. It's only a portent of trouble. We'll take another time out, come back with the another messy situation. The Antonio Brown situation is so fluid that by the time this show gets published in a matter of, an, a, matter of a couple of hours, it may have already changed again. Take a time out. Sports from the Hood with Chugs on after this. You're tuned in to Sports from the Hood with the Internet's premier location for no-nonsense commentary, insight, and opinion on the world of sports. And now, the man with 100% certified fresh tape, your host, KJ Green. On we go in the hoodwood. I am KJ Green. Welcome back. And the NFL is ramping up its player acquisitions and deals ahead of the start of the new business year, which will be uh, next Wednesday, the 13th. There have been players that have been shuffled about. Uh, Olivier Vernon was just traded to the Cleveland Browns for Kevin Zeitler. And that just broke just before noon on uh, Friday. Also, uh, Case Keenum has been, uh, will be traded to Washington for a six round pick in the 2020 draft. That just came across about an hour ago. Keenum, who had signed a two year deal with Denver after a great uh, 2017 in Minnesota and uh, had kind of a so-so year in in Denver now with the Broncos having uh going to be acquiring Joe Flacco from Baltimore really have no use for Case Keenum and since Washington with the uh, messy situation that the, the Alex uh Smith injury has caused is a need for a quarterback so Denver has traded Keenum to Washington but the one player that is demanding a trade and we still do not know where he's going to go is loquacious wide receiver Antonio Brown whose very messy divorce from the Steelers is drawing out like a very very sharp blade and it is just tearing the Steelers up for the the questions on the leadership of Ben Roethlisberger, the coaching style of Mike Tomlin, personnel situations, and how fractured that clubhouse would be. But now there are teams who may want the very talented wide receiver, but are reluctant to take on the baggage that he may bring. Now, there was rumored to be a trade in the works for Pittsburgh to trade Brown to the Buffalo Bills, which 
Nothing against Buffalo. I've been to Buffalo numerous times. It is a nice city. Great fans. Great food. And and not just the chicken wings. But (laughs) Buffalo is a good football town. But in terms of playoff stature, really hasn't been the type of Berg football team or football haven it was in say the early the early to late 90s i mean up until last year the bills had made the playoffs in the 21st century but they did manage to make the playoffs last year antonio brown being traded to the bills would be more or less like sending his his career into the freezer ask shady mccoy who got sent to buffalo and though he is playing fairly respectable up there, isn't getting the kind of pub he was getting when he played in Philly. That said, Antonio Brown was allegedly going to the Bills, as had been reported by a number of sources. The NFL's tweet, uh, Twitter web, uh, Twitter page even said that Brown was going to the Bills. Something that Brown retweeted and refuted calling it fake news now there are only a handful of teams that can afford antonio brown anyway and there are even fewer teams that would have the kind of personnel makeup that would be able to withstand the type of player that antonio brown is very loud, boisterous, demanding of the ball. I pray that he doesn't go to Green Bay. Putting Antonio Brown and, and, and Aaron Rodgers together is like putting gasoline and a blowtorch together. It would be explosive. I don't want to see that personally as selfish as a Minnesota Vikings fan. But there are few teams that would have a veteran quarterback a strong coaching personnel set in place that will be able to absorb Antonio Brown and the type of inflammatory personality that he has. Antonio Brown, without question, is one of the top receivers in the NFL. Great hands, great work ethic, gets to the end zone, takes hits, plays, plays basically as hard as a player can play. My thing is is this. Antonio Brown, like many wide receivers, has a diva personality. Wide receivers do not do what they do unless they are thrown the ball. Then they can make whatever magic they can do. Quarterbacks handle the ball on every snap. Defensive players are trying to get to the ball. Running backs are useful as a runner and a receiver. Wide receivers are one-dimensional. Though they are talented, they have only use when they are catching the ball. Antonio Brown ain't running back punts or kickoffs anymore. Especially after he did the jump kick on the Browns player a few years ago. He's not running back punts. So... A player like that is going to holler for the ball, demand the ball, demand that they are a high focus of an offense. That leads to a player being very volatile. I'll go back to one of my favorite players, Randy Moss. Dangerous receiver, speed demon, but only useful when he had a capable quarterback that was able to get him the ball. Sending Antonio Brown to Buffalo would have deep-sixed his career. You really think Josh Allen would have been talented enough to be able to keep him happy getting him the ball. You can cross off a number of teams with young quarterbacks that will not be able to handle a player like Antonio Brown in their huddle simply because they're not experienced enough. He's not going back to Pittsburgh. That's just a messy divorce in itself. 
and the fractured relationship he had with Ben Roethlisberger to begin with is almost nil now. Where is Antonio Brown going? I've heard people speculate he wanted to go out to the West Coast. Would him and a healthy Jimmy Garoppolo be good in, in San Francisco? That'd be an interesting combination. Would him and Derek Carr in the East Bay, even though they're going to Las Vegas here soon, would that be a, a good combination? I think it would. The Steelers are in the type of position they want to trade Antonio Brown somewhere that he won't hurt them later. Preferably to a team that they're not going to play for another three, four years. Every team plays every team at least once every four years. So you're not going to totally avoid them. They're not going to trade Antonio Brown to someone in the AFC North. Baltimore, Cleveland, Cincinnati. That's not going to happen because you know Antonio Brown would have his claws sharpened for the twice a year meeting. So that's not going to happen. Look for the Steelers to put Antonio Brown somewhere out west where they don't have to deal with him for another number of years. But the window is closing and the team pool of who Brown can be traded to is rapidly shrinking. The teams that could afford to get Antonio Brown are few and far between. And Pittsburgh, at first, asking a first round, is not going to get that price. Because there isn't that many teams that are going to be demanding of Brown and his services and fit the criteria that Pittsburgh wants to keep Brown from coming back and burning them. This is a messy situation to be sure and a very fluid one. Stay tuned to the Hoodwood and we'll get as many updates as possible. We'll take our final timeout, come back with a chock full Hoodwood Hot 5, the last top 10 of the Hoodwood Hot 5 of the season. We'll continue to have the Hoodwood Hot 5 as March Madness goes, but the last ranking of the season of the Hoodwood Hot 5 will be coming up, as well as Fat Dap and Head Slap and the final word of the week as Sports from the Hoodwood heads down the home stretch after this. You're tuned into Sports from the Hoodwood, the Internet's foremost location for the most honest insight and opinion on the world of sports. Now, once again, here's the man of the hour after hours, your host, K.J. Green. Rounding third and headed for home here in the Hoodwood. I am K.J. Green, and without much further ado, let's get into some college hoops with the Hoodwood Hot Five. We'll start off this week with not a one-line take, but actually another messy situation. Seems like with the weather, everything just gets messier and messier, don't it? LSU is having a banner year. They are 25-5 and five this year, and just on the cusp of the top 10, and they look as if they may have a real chance to win the SEC outright as they are right now tied for first with Tennessee. LSU at 15-2, and two, tied with Tennessee, and can win the SEC outright if they beat a Wobegon Vanderbilt, who is winless in the SEC, and Tennessee loses to Auburn, which is not a foregone conclusion because ten, uh, you would think that Auburn, coached by one Bruce Pearl, would love to knock his former team out of first place in the SEC and play spoiler. That being said, LSU is having a great year, one not seen in the bayou since Holocon days of Dale Brown, but their coach Will Wade is under increasing fire for comments made in a wiretapped conversation about handlers and recruits and offers. Now, this heavily profanity-laced rant to one of LSU's so-called handlers of players is something 
that is going to get Will Wade in deep, deep trouble. The intercepted phone calls between Wade and business manager Christian Dawkins was reflecting Wade's frustration about the acquisition of a recruit. And many people think it was for current LSU guard Javante Smart, whom Wade was trying to then recruit. The talk of payments, payoffs. And things to keep his parents happy were in this conversation. Now, under current rules, this is outlying numerous violations. One that could make not only make Javante Smart ineligible, but will more than likely get Will Wade fired as coach of LSU and make him very radioactive as a coach. If you can remember, Kelvin Sampson, when he coached at Oklahoma, got himself into trouble in recruiting practices, got himself into trouble in Indiana, and for a a number of years was Felina Non Grata, cat not welcome, in the coaching ranks. He was out of the college coaching ranks for a while before resurfacing at Houston and making that team top 10. But you have to wonder how much of this messy situation that Wade has gotten himself into and Wade for his part now has been very low-key and mum about what was on these conversations but there is a court appearance that is going on in April and you have to wonder what kind of fallout from this is going to openly affect LSU I'll harken back to when there was recruiting allegations in Arizona that not only cost Sean Miller his job, but deep sixth, a talented Arizona Wildcats team that had dreams of a final four was soon to be number one draft pick DeAndre Ayton. That team stumbled out of the Pac-12 tourney. And then was ambushed by a good Buffalo team. Now, I'm not taking anything away from Buffalo, who proved to be more than just a one-year wonder. But, I digress. Arizona, with the cloud of suspicion, with the messy Sean Miller situation over their head, played distracted. Played like a team out of sorts. And was ripe for an upset. They got poleaxed by Buffalo and sent on their way and Arizona is a non-factor in the Pac-12 race this year. One has to wonder will the same fate befall LSU? They're 25-5 and this year. More than likely will beat Vanderbilt and get a very good seed in the SEC tournament. But will that distraction turn the players' heads, wondering, is the coach still going to be there? Is he on his way out? Are we going to be on probation? LSU is a team that will be beat in the SEC tournament and suffer a fate of falling in the NCAA tournament way earlier than they were supposed to. You can bank on that. Continuing with the Hoodwood Hot Five, Kansas will not repeat, not win the Big 12 regular season title for the first time in 14 years. Standing right now at 11-6, and six, they cannot win the Big 12 title. Texas Tech and Kansas State are currently tied for the lead at the Big 12 lead. Now, Kansas can still win the Big 12 tournament, but it has been 14 seasons since a team other than Kansas had won the Big 12 title. Kansas has either won or shared the last 14 Big 12 titles. Now, speaking of conference races, is the American on the rise as a multi-big conference? I mean, yes, Houston is top 10. Cincinnati and Central Florida played a rock fight battle uh, Thursday night in Orlando with 
Central Florida coming out on top. They're a top 25 team. Cincinnati's a top 25 team. Memphis is on the cusp. So is Temple. Could the American actually send more than just the, their top three ranked team? Could they send four or five? I think they should. More than the sorry Pac-12, who only should only deserve one. One more point about Zion Williamson. Why do I think that he's going to make just a cameo appearance in the NCAA tournament and then declare for the NBA draft right after Duke gets beat? Or if he has a monster performance, just a passing thought. The Littlewood top 10 reads like this from 10 to 1. Houston is number 10. Michigan stays at number 9. Texas Tech is new to the rankings at number 8. Down 1 from 7 to 6 is Michigan. Up 2 from 8 to 6 is Tennessee. And then the top 5 stays the same with Duke at 5, UNC at 4, Kentucky at 3, Virginia at 2, and Gonzaga remaining the number one team in the Hoodwood Top 10. So now with conference tournaments starting, that will be that for the Hoodwood Top 10. And we'll speculate on who goes where in the Hoodwood Top 5 next week. Uh, Nevada drops out of the Top 10 after their loss to Utah State. And I really have a problem with, and I'll get to that in the head slap, of crowd control and visitors' reactions to a team getting beat. But we'll get to that in just a moment. Now, let's, that's the Ty Hoodwood Hot 5. Let's turn to the Fat Dap and Head Slap of the Week. Fat Dap goes to Sammy Jones of Cal State Fullerton. Now, you would think, who is that? He, after four years of being a team manager, got into the Titans game against Cal Poly last week. Cal State Fullerton got clearance for the NCAA after doing numerous lengthy paperwork to be able to bring Jones onto the roster. Now, Jones, who wasn't on the original roster, not on scholarship, was able to get into the game late against Cal Poly. He not only got in, but he scored a late bucket on a nifty dribble drive, and he got fouled. So he completed a three-point play in the Titans' 86-75 win over Cal Poly. Now, he will suit up again in the Titans' home finale against Hawaii, but he's already a school legend for fulfilling that every man dream. Here's to you, Sammy, for getting a memorable moment. Now, originally, I was going to give the head slap to Bryce Harper, who, in his initial press conference, talked about bringing a title to D.C., even though he plays for Philly, but Instead, I will give the head slap to the University of Nevada, who dropped out of the Hoodwood Top 10 after a loss to Utah State. Now, Utah State not only upsetting Top 10 Nevada, but clinched the uh, Mountain West Conference regular season title. And their fans in Logan stormed the floor, as is more or less a custom, something that isn't unusual. When Central Florida beat Cincinnati Thursday night, their fans stormed the floor. But unlike Cincinnati, who just kind of trudged off the floor quickly and quietly after taking the L, the Nevada players claimed that they were hit and slapped by onrushing Utah State fans. And in film Saturday night, were visibly agitated, wanting to fight after the game now were the fans maybe in the wrong for touching the players when they were going off maybe but i think that this stems more from a sore sport nevada than a overly delirious utah state head slap to nevada and partially to utah state security for not making sure that the court storming was done in an orderly manner And now, uh, without much further ado, let's go to the final word from the wood. And this final word isn't a solemn commentary, but a reflection. Eleven years ago, the hood wood was getting pounded by a snowstorm. We got nine inches of snow, but the snow was not keeping me from seeing something, an event that would change my life for a second time. March 11, 2008, I became a father for the second time. My daughter Jasmine came in the world with... 
a nice and loud holler and then became about as serene as a person could be. Never seen a baby that calm, that young. But nevertheless, my youngest daughter, Jasmine, was born. And over the last 11 years, I have seen her grown into a very precocious young lady. Very inquisitive, very smart, and very creative. Went to a ceramics class and she was just running rings around me because I can't paint. But she can. But nevertheless, my youngest daughter will be 11 on the 11th she is a sweet girl very independent independent almost to a fault and as smart as the day is long she is my little shortbread and i love her to death happy birthday to my daughter jasmine who will be 11 on monday and that is the final word from the woods with the music coming up in the background you know that means your time in the hood is just about done and i thank you again for your visit this week email for the show is kjgreen at blackbanderproductions.com you can send me emails on show topics, questions, comments and criticism. I welcome your correspondence and I try to respond to every email. You can catch this podcast on a number of sites including iTunes and Google Play. The show site itself is on hoodwoodsports.podbean.com um, I'm also on Facebook at Black Band Productions and Enterprises. I'm on Twitter as well at KJ Green 20 and KJ Green BB and YouTube. So that's that from the Hoodwood fellow sports fans. Until next time out, I'm KJ Green 30. Sports from the Hoodwood is a Black Bandit Productions and Enterprises presentation of a 551 audio and films